how are we to think about truth claims and religion, rationality and faith? Um, one thing that we were wondering is, is there an objective truth? And can these beliefs ever be verified in our minds to a sufficient degree? Well, I think we need to think, first of all, of truth claims in general. And what I'm going to say applies not only to religion, but science and everyday life. I suppose we think of objective and subjective as two ends of a spectrum. Objective means person independent, being unbiased, impartial and uninfluenced and not letting any emotions or personal opinions come into the picture while we're making decisions or evaluations. Subjective is the opposite, person dependent. Now it used to be thought that the natural sciences were completely objective and impartial, but philosophers of science have long since shown that science is a human activity and all scientists bring to their work a degree of unavoidable subjectivity. Now we come to the truth question and we meet all kinds of views. There's first of all, what is often called conventionalism. All meaning is relative. But of course, the statement that all meaning is relative refutes itself because it itself must have relative meaning so we can discard it. And I find it's very easy actually to see that everyone believes in objective truth at some level. If you're accused of a crime that you didn't commit and you appear in court and the prosecution case is very clever, suppose the judge says there's no such thing as objective truth. So what he's going to do is to judge the case on the basis of his own prejudices. And he likes the prosecution arguments. He doesn't like yours. And so he declares you guilty. I think you would react with outrage and you'd protest strongly in the name of truth and objective fairness. You believe in truth. Now, mm -hmm. when we think of truth, there are various important theories of truth. First of all, there's the correspondence theory. Water is a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. The truth of this statement is not found by examining the statement, but has to do with a past fact that's outside the statement to which the statement corresponds. And then a necessary condition for truth is coherence. An incoherent statement is false. So when we come to the question you ask of verification, then we need to ask ourselves what proof is. Now, I'm a pure mathematician, and that's the only subject where you get rigorous proof. In pure mathematics, for example, axiomatic geometry, but in science in general and in everyday life, you do not get that absolute sense of, of proof. Absolutely. You get pointers, you get evidence, but you cannot have 100% proof. And that means, and it's important to say this, although nothing is absolutely certain, there are many things that are certain enough so that you risk your life on them. Mm -hmm. And that's important when we come to think of, of Christian truth. You see, I cannot be absolutely certain that a surgeon is going to save my life, but I have enough evidence to trust him or her to do the operation. Similarly with flying across the Atlantic. I can't prove mathematically that the plane will get me there, but I have enough evidence to think it can uh, get us there. So uh, summing that up, there is truth and we all believe there is truth. A friend of mine once said, people are only postmodern and relative in areas that they think are not important, like areas of value. But I think even in the areas of value, I have never met anybody who thinks it's right to torture infants. So we believe in an absolute moral value there. So I think this gives us a start. There is truth we can know it but never absolutely certainly but certain enough to rely uh, on it yeah absolutely i mean t.s lewis talks about the importance of values about you know whether it's in the abolition manner and other writings um and you know to the point that you recently you know just brought up in terms of you know, objective truths truths that we know or truths that we can determine and then the real the real sort of 
conflict being in bringing those truth and seeing values in the uh, moral sphere. Uh, whether, That's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether, I mean, you know, talking about postmodernism, talking about you know, whether we analyze philosophy of Nietzsche or other thinkers, uh, the question of whether we can establish these values. And, you know, naturally, what, what is brought forth from that is the idea of since we're living in a constantly changing world, since there are, as you said, you know, these competing ideas or that lack of full certainty, but the discussion, which is amazing, having that discussion around uh, what is true and right, um, how can we at the present moment, you know, given the fact that we don't have, we're not a thousand years into the future, we don't know everything, um, how can we believe uh, as best as we can in a single eternal truth um, and a single understanding of the world? Well, uh, the way I approach this is, the, is, first of all, as a scientist, I'm a critical realist. That means I believe there's truth out there. Otherwise, no one would do science. If you don't believe there's truth to be found, you wouldn't do science. Mm -hmm. But I believe that although we don't understand it completely, we're getting better and better at understanding it. Galileo understood a lot, Kepler even more, Newton even more than that, and Einstein even more than that. So that we're approaching something and we must be humble enough to realize we're not exactly there. Now that's the position in terms of the scientists, in terms of the sciences. But I do not myself think that the fact that science is changing and progressing, which it is, has made it any more difficult to believe in the eternal truth that there is a creator God who started and upholds the universe. Indeed, I, I think actually that science has made it easier to believe in that eternal truth. Wow. wow. Yeah, I mean, that is that's a question. You know, that's what everyone has to wonder for themselves, wrestle, um, you know, themselves. And I mean, you you speak on bioethics, you speak on the vastly uncertain future, you know, I mean, where Imagine what Kepler would have, you know, how they, how he would react if he saw the current world, how these great minds, as brilliant as they were, would um, react if they saw all the progress that we've made um, with this sort of uncertainty looking out into the future. Everything uh, that we don't know will happen a thousand years from now. Um, what gives you hope for um, our better understanding for that sort of um, understanding of God? and God's relationship to the world um, when we just, when we know, when we're just realizing how little we know, you know, when there's so much uncertainty. Well, you're very, very modest and I appreciate that. And we do need to be humble in the face of the great unknown. On the other hand, you see, I believe it's not just a one way system. It's not that we have to, uh, search this all out for ourselves. I do believe that the Creator God has revealed something to us. In other words, if you look at our universe that science studies, I believe that gives solid evidence of God's existence. And also, I believe that, and we can come to that a bit later, in our discussion, I believe that the scriptures give very, the Bible gives very powerful evidence and then human experience. We're, we're not left without an evidence base. We can see evidence that, that God exists. And one particular piece of evidence that, that God exists for me as a scientist it might surprise some of you. It's that we can do science in the first place. Uh, and well, why do I say that? Well, you see, if you are a committed scientist, you must believe something. And that is that you must believe in the rational intelligibility of the universe or the mathematical intelligibility of the universe. And that's a matter of faith. Einstein himself said, you know, I cannot imagine a genuine scientist without that faith. Now, you talk about evidence. Why should I believe that the universe is rationally intelligible? 
Here I am with my mind studying science, but many of my atheist colleagues tell me that the mind is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And sometimes I say to them, I tease them a little bit, that I say, hmm, if you knew that your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? And I've always got the answer, no. So I say to them, you have a problem. You're telling me you do science and you trust your science. Mm -hmm. You trust your mind to do it. And yet your theory is that you cannot trust the mind. And that was something, by the way, that Charles Darwin realized a long time ago. Uh, he could see that there was a real problem there. He wrote this, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy. And Thomas Nagel, a modern American philosopher, a very brilliant man, he says, um, and he's a strong atheist, he doesn't want there to be a God, but he said, if the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. Now, where am I going with this? What I'm saying is that atheism, the view that there is no God, makes a nonsense of our trust in our minds to do science. Does Christianity do any better? Massively better. Now, I mentioned Galileo, Kepler, Newton, all of those uh, men believed in God. And when C.S. Lewis was describing what went on in the 16th and 17th centuries, he linked the biblical worldview, the theistic worldview with the rise of modern science. And he put it this way. He said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law and nature because they believed in a legislator. In other words, the faith in God that Galileo, Kepler, and Newton had didn't hinder the science. It was the very motor that drove it. So there are two sides of the picture for me. If I follow the, the Christian line, I have an understanding of why science can be done because the same God that created the universe out there, so to speak, created my mind in here. But if I follow the no God atheistic view, I find that it's undermining the very rationality I need to do science. So that's the beginnings to my mind of a very powerful evidence-based argument. Absolutely. And, um, you're speaking a bit to the mind earlier, that whole question of um, Cartesian dualism or that whole question of what is the mind, you know, materialism versus um, who we are, you know, that goes to those uh, big questions. When we talk about sort of those, uh, those, those arguments for and against for God existing, I mean, you've talked in the past about the fine tuning argument, you've talked in the past about, um, you know, first move. And there are all these different sort of rational arguments for why God may exist. Um, you touched on a lot of this. Um, so if, if, if we've answered this for the most part, we can definitely move on. Um, but sort of with all of these questions, um, what in your mind has been some of that, whether it be biblical or otherwise, evidence-based reasoning um, for the existence of God? Well, what I've just said to you is very important. Uh, the fact that we can do science is number one for mm -hmm. me. That links in with the history of science, uh, as I've just mentioned. But then you very rightly brought up uh, the question of fine tuning. I, I've got a friend in my university who's a famous philosopher, and he's a strong atheist. And he invited me to talk to his students about evidence for belief in God. And he said, I hope you're going to use the best argument against atheism. Oh, I said, what's that? You tell me and I'll use it. He said, if ever I were going to be persuaded to be a Christian like you, the fine tuning argument would play a very great role. That's the idea, as you know, that uh, 
many of the fundamental constants of nature have to be very precise in order to have a universe with life on it. And scientists are agreed that the fine tuning is a fact. And they're also agreed that we need an explanation for it. <coughs> and in my view, the God explanation is by far the most sensible. It makes a lot of sense. And um, I think sort of moving even deeper within that uh, to see your view, um, you know, you talked uh, a lot on how science and religion, in fact, support each other in our understanding of the universe, in our motivation for pursuing science. Um, you're a mathematician. You've done some incredible work in both the fields of mathematics and philosophy. And personally, uh, through the work that you have done, the research, um, I was wondering uh, what has been the most compelling argument uh, for the existence of God, and especially the truth of Christianity for you and the work that you've done, uh, both from a logical, but also a personal perspective, you know, what do you look to in the face of all these doubts and questions that one may have, you know, in this uncertainty uh, that gives you confidence in God through the work that you've done? Well, now there are several questions there. Apologies for that. Together. Apologies for that. There's, Long it's minutes. all right. The, there's first the, the question as a scientist that I see that science and faith in God are totally compatible. And I've given you some reasons. Another very important reason is that we need to understand that the science explanation and the God explanation are not the same kind of explanation. A very simple example is we ask <clears throat> why the water is boiling and we can give a scientific answer in terms of the agitation of water molecules and so on. But the water may well be bo boiling because I'd like a cup of tea. That's a different explanation in terms of a person, an agent, myself, my desire. So that the scientific explanation and the personal explanation fit together and they're both necessary. And I wish people could see this more clearly because if they could, they wouldn't see a clash between science and faith in God. They'd see God as explaining um, why there is a universe at all for science to study. I often put it this way, the God explanation no more conflicts with a scientific explanation than Henry Ford conflicts with physics as an explanation for the existence of the motor car. They're complementary explanations, and that takes a great deal of, of heat out of the whole question. But now, you come to Christianity specifically, and of course, my reasons for believing Christianity go beyond science, the natural sciences. The natural sciences may well point to the existence of a mind behind the universe, but whose mind? What mind? Christianity is history specific and experience specific. What do I mean by that? I mean that I'm a Christian because of the evidence of history. You see, the natural sciences are rational, we hope, but they do not um, tell you all that is rational. History is a rational discipline. Experience, I would hope, can have very strong rational elements. And so we need to start thinking about the sources. Where do I find out about Christianity? And first of all, there are the historical facts about Jesus coming down specifically to the, the heart of the question. And what many people do not realize is that ancient historians, they're the experts on history, are almost entirely agreed about certain basic things. Let me quote someone from Princeton, James Charlesworth. I don't think there's any serious historian who doubts the existence of Jesus. We have more evidence for Jesus than we have for almost anybody from his time period. And an Oxford scholar, Christopher Tuckett, author of a Cambridge text on the historical Jesus, listen to what he says. All this does at least render highly implausible any far-fetched theories that even Jesus' very existence was a Christian invention. The fact that he existed that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, 
for whatever reason, and that he had a band of followers who continued to support his cause seems to be part of the bedrock of historical tradition. And then he adds this, if nothing else, the non-Christian evidence can provide us with certainty on that score. You see, most scholars believe that Josephus from AD 37 to 100, who is a first century Roman Jewish historian, wrote one of the earliest surviving accounts that mentioned Jesus' crucifixion. And then there was Tacitus, AD 56 to 117, a historian and senator. He confirmed this, saying, quote, Christ suffered the extreme penalty, crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And I could go on because it's very important for me that this is all evidence-based. And the evidence for the authenticity of the New Testament is very high. First of all, we have a huge number of manuscripts. Several of them date back to AD 200. And I just mentioned Tacitus, but of his works, uh, he <clears throat> wrote between the second and fourth century. Sorry, he wrote about AD 116. And the first six books of his annals survive in only one manuscript, which was copied about 700 years later, and yet no one doubts his authenticity. In fact, the New Testament is one of the most authenticated documents in the world. So that is a wonderful start for anyone wanting to know the basis of uh, Christianity. And what I would say, just in summarizing this, it is amazing even how many atheist historians, what they believe about Jesus. Let me give you one extreme example. Gerd Ludemann, a famous German atheist, he believes Jesus was crucified in AD 30. A few days after his death, his disciples announced he'd risen. They maintained this conviction for the rest of their lives. The witnesses are named, Peter, James, Paul, and so on. And perhaps most importantly of all, shortly after the death of Jesus, there appears a formal confession of faith that refers to the resurrection. And things like that are, are quite remarkable to my mind that ancient historians who are the experts on this, even if they're atheists, are honest enough to tell us that there's a great deal of evidence for the truth of what's contained in the Gospels. So we can have historical certainty as far as that goes. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that, Dr. Lennox. Um, I think it's amazing so far in this talk, we've been able to um, really parse out and discuss sort of reasoning for God, you know, God as the creator of creation, God as sort of that first mover, um, also God from that rational perspective that you're speaking on for the motivation of science. And we talked also um, within this larger open mind discussion uh, that we are to have with other people um, about sort of the evidence for Christianity historically, um, outside, you know, rationally also historically um, in this discussion. And, you know, I think a part of this discussion that we are to have is also with people of different faiths, respectfully and openly. Um, you know, when we talk about the Abrahamic religions, especially there is a, um, a shared history in many regards, and there is a great discussion to have with uh, people from the Jewish and Muslim faiths. Speaking on your perspective, I was wondering uh, what in your mind perhaps distinguishes Christianity um, from a logical historical perspective uh, from the other Abrahamic religions? Um, what in your mind um, sort of separates Christian doctrine and, and why uh, does that compel you in faith uniquely? Well, thank you for that question because it, it's a very important question. And I have friends in all the religions you mention. And what is hugely important when we approach this question is to say that when we are discussing differences, we must first establish the commonalities. And the commonalities that are hugely important are often to be found in the moral sphere. And you'll find in the three religions you mentioned, and indeed in every other religion, you will find certain basic core values that are agreed. For example, the golden rule, do unto others 
what you would like them to do to you is it found in every something. single religion on earth. And it's important to say that because when you discuss differences, it's important to realize that as Christians, we're not looking down on other people as if they were less uh, morally capable than we are. In fact, even <clears throat> non-religious friends can put professing religious people to shame by their moral behavior. Absolutely. Now, the reason for that, as I understand it, is that every human being, irrespective of their worldview, is made in the image of God as a moral being. So I may have to take rebukes as Abraham did. The, the founder of the Abrahamic religions, he was rebuked by Pharaoh for his uh, moral <clears throat> compromise. And Pharaoh showed that he understood morality in that area better than Abram did. So with that said, then we can turn to the questions of the differences. And the, here is uh, the way I begin to think about it. We've talked about evidence from rationality and history. Now, you've noticed I quoted several ancient historians. Now, what do the three main monotheistic religions believe about Jesus' death and resurrection? Well, first, my Jewish friends believe that he died but did not rise. My Muslim friends believe he did not die. I believe he died and rose again. Now, those three things cannot be simultaneously true. And I would step back and think of these atheistic historians I've quoted. What do they say is the historical evidence? The historical evidence is he died, he was crucified, and <clears throat> he was buried, and reports were issued of him having been seen after his death. Now, of course, an atheist historian is not going to believe in the resurrection. As the distance they will go, which is fascinating, is that there certainly were, were reports of him being alive, but more significantly, there were reports of the tomb actually being empty. And that is very interesting indeed. Let me quote another ancient historian on that. Michael Grant of Edinburgh says, true, the discovery of the empty tomb is differently described by the various gospels, but if we apply the same sort of criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary source, then the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. So I approach this simply from a historical perspective. And I come to the conclusion, and you made a very important point earlier as well, and, and that was that we must make up our own minds. The evidence tells me that Jesus died uh, he, by crucifixion. He was buried. The tomb was found empty. And the most reasonable explanation I can find of that is that he rose from the dead. So that is what helps me to move in the direction of Christianity. I'm not despising other people for their morality. Absolutely not. They may put me to shame. But the differences are more to be seen in the historicity. And then there's another thing, if I could just mention that too. And that is uh, the whole question of what we mean by a religion. You see, many people think that Christianity is a religion in the sense of it well they think of big buildings often empty ritual all kinds of rules and regulations that you've got to follow in the hope one day may be of being accepted by god and admitted into heaven and various other religions have similar versions of that but if you investigate what that is and it can often be a huge slavery people desperately trying to follow a given set of rules in the hope that they'll be accepted and never sure because it depends on them that is a merit-based system in fact it's very like the university of pennsylvania if you don't mind me saying so you know you get an entrance in and that's really something to get into you pen and congratulations of all of you that have done but i'm afraid 
uh, I think you know as well as I do that even if all the professors are delightful people, they cannot guarantee that you get a degree. Why? Because it depends on your merit. And so many people think of religion like that and of Christianity like that. Well, let me say something radical here. If that's religion, Christianity, true Christianity is not a religion because it's not merit based. This is the utterly radical difference between Christianity and all other religions. It does not consist in a merit based acceptance by God at a final judgment. It tells us, by contrast, that we can be accepted at the beginning of the path and it teaches that the initial step on the Christian path is not a rite, a ritual or a ceremony performed on an infant or adult. It's a step of personal commitment to Jesus Christ that involves believing that he is God who has come into the world to give his life as a ransom for our sins. That is the mess we've made of our own lives and sadly that of others sometime. So Christianity is not about religion in the commonly accepted sense, but about a personal relationship with God. And one statement that Jesus made that's very important to me, you asked me to be personal and here it comes. He said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. That is, has it already. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And that statement, astounding though it is, is made in the context of another astounding claim that Jesus is himself going to be the final judge. And if the judge says that if I personally trust him, he will declare me to be right with God, not on the grounds of my merit or anything special about me, but on the grounds that he has himself paid on the cross the penalty of the guilty verdict that my sins have merited, then I can trust that. And the evidence for it, as the Christian Apostle Paul said to the philosophers at Athens, the evidence for it is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Can I just say finally on this point, According to Christianity, salvation means exactly that. It's action on the part of God to rescue those who could not help themselves. It's the magnificent doctrine of the grace of God. And it says that if they will, anyone can be forgiven and find a new life and friendship with God, whoever they are, whatever they've done, and they can know it. And in that uh, constitutes the uniqueness of Christianity, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, thank you for that, that masterclass for that explanation on the principles of, of Christianity. And also, I just want to thank you for emphasizing, for talking about, you know, concurrent with this discussion, concurrent with the force of your beliefs, um, our need to respect other people and respect their beliefs when we approach this discussion. And always, um, you know, sort of bringing this back out with our understanding of uh, your belief in Christianity. And, you know, this world is so complex. And, um, you know, you've talked in the past about the moral quandaries. We've talked about the rational, but, you know, we are we are emotional beings, you know, and, and life can be hard. Life has its ups and downs, and we all have to deal with them, you know? And um, I was wondering sort of like, when we look at, you know, first the rational aspect of, of um, I'll get into the emotional if that's possible with my second question, but first with the rational aspect, when we look um, specifically with Christianity or, but just in general, mostly, um, you know, when we come to these sort of uh, clashes, it can seem with, with uh, science and religion, you know, I was wondering if you had any advice on, on how we should think about uh, and think through the times when specific religious history or understanding of the world and popular scientific conceptions of the world uh, seemingly clash. For example, um, the biblical genealogy of humanity in Genesis um, and uh, popular scientific conception of, of evolution, you know, the scientific idea of evolution. You know, how should we think through um, these two ideas? Or, you know, any time that there is this sort of... Um, dissonance or this question of science and a religious understanding of the world. And, you know, that also goes into how we interpret uh, religious texts and our religious understanding. 
Sure. Well, there are many questions there and we'd need hours to discuss them. But let, let me tell you my perspective on this. I have spent my whole life being open to questions. Uh, some people ask me, do I ever doubt? And I say I spend all my time doubting. If by doubt you mean being open to question. Mm -hmm. When doubt is mentioned, many people think of a kind of black hole into which you feel you're falling where everything is disastrous. But uh, the word doubt comes from the Latin dubitari, which means to be in two minds. And I have deliberately, right from the very beginning of my time at Cambridge many years ago, exposed my faith in God to questioning. Now, some of the questions that come up, you, you've mentioned evolution is a very big one. And because it's a big one, I've spent a lot of time recently writing a new major book on it, which I could shamelessly advertise. Please, it's, please. Called, it's called Cosmic Chemistry, Do God and Science Mix? And I, I think the short answer to that question, there's a long answer and I give it in the book, is that evolution means many things. And of course, Darwin observed certain things brilliantly, but as I understand them, they are more in the, at the level of microevolution, cyclic change and so on. And that's not controversial. What is maybe more controversial uh, is the whole question of whether uh, all of life and its variation can be produced by natural selection and mutation, to name the two main things in the neo-Darwinian view. Now, the interesting thing about that is that whatever evolution does or doesn't do, it does not explain the origin of life for a very simple logical reason. That evolution, again, whatever it does or doesn't do, depends on life existing to start with. So it cannot explain life. The origin of life is still one of the deep mysteries. And my comment on that, and here again I see evidence of God, is this. We live in a universe that is in part describable in the language of mathematics. And in the biosphere, it is in part describable in the language of genetics. And genetics has revealed to us the longest word we've ever discovered in four chemical letters. It's the human genome. It's 3.4, roughly speaking, billion letters long. And both of those things, whatever natural mechanisms are involved, fit, resonate beautifully with the statement that is made opening the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word. All things came to be through the Word. This is a Word-based universe, uh, certainly in terms of physics, chemistry, astrophysics, and now in biology. So that for me is a wonderful evidence of God's fingerprints. Now I said, no matter what um, natural um, processes are involved, clearly God created a world, as far as I can see it, with loads of natural processes that uh, to a large extent go on of their own accord. Now, <clears throat> that is why, of course, uh, many people who believe in God also believe in evolution at different levels because they think that God uh, has put brilliant mechanisms into the world that allow this to happen. Now, I'm a mathematician and we have a track record of skepticism here. And why I'm skeptical, you can read in my book, but let me say, my faith in God doesn't depend on a theorem in biology. God can create and develop life any way he likes. The question is, how did he actually do it? And what I would leave you with on this is the very provocative point that there have been huge new developments in biology. It's now called the third way in biology. And one of its leaders is a colleague of mine in Oxford, Professor Dennis Noble, a fellow of the Royal Society, an absolute genius. And he has made the statement explicitly and given evidence for it that neo-Darwinism that has held the field for years now doesn't need to be supplemented or <clears throat> extended. It needs to be replaced because it's completely inadequate. So watch this space. But what scientists are now discovering in biology is levels of complexity way beyond the complexity of DNA, epigenetic complexity.
And again, I go into this in detail in my book. So to sum that up, it seems to me that biological studies are calling in question the neo-Darwinism that many people like Richard Dawkins have used to get rid of God. And actually God is reappearing in the fact that what these new levels of complexity are pointing towards is an increased dimension of the, in my view, input of mind in the biological sphere. So this is a fascinating area. And it illustrates the fact that sometimes if you wait for a while, some of the most apparently powerful objections to God and the Bible actually uh, turn out uh, to have very little force indeed. Fascinating discussion. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you for the answer. Um, you know, but these are things that everyone has to deal with and, you know, trying to navigate that is very important. Um, you know, on the one side, we have sort of that, that idea of scripture and understanding the world and sort of going back to my preface that was far too long, um, but hopefully I can make it a little more useful with the second question. Um, when we look at our morality, when we look at our emotions and our understanding of the world holistically, um, you know, there are so many questions around the interpretation of uh, God's will, of, of um, a faith-based understanding the world and how that governs the way that we think about the universe that you've talked about. Um, and I was wondering uh, how we should approach, approach, you know, the interpretation of God's will and this, you know, and a faith-based understanding of the world, especially on issues um, where religious texts do not directly speak on you, whether it be the Bible or the Quran or the Torah, um, you know, there are so many issues that, you know, 2000 years or, you know, many years from the writing of these texts, um, you know, they are now at the fore of our society that where they were not necessarily relevant before, or, you know, in areas where people have these uh, discussions around what exactly, what exactly is meant um, by these texts, by the way that we think about religion, how do we interpret these or how should we approach it? You know, if we have different interpretations. Well, I think we approach it like we approach any text. In other words, we think about it. Let me take a, a, an explicit example. The Bible says nothing about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So what do we say about artificial intelligence? Well, in the Bible, you find uh, certain descriptions of the nature of human beings, and you can apply those and the moral um, the moral standards of scripture to many of the discussions on artificial intelligence today, which is why, if you don't mind me saying so, I wrote another book called 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. Not because I thought the Bible speaks directly on the topic, but indirectly, there are so many things in there that are relevant to the way in which we wrestle with the great moral problems that uh, AI raises. Let me give you another example, COVID. We're facing the Omicron variety and uh, it's, it's ravaging through the world. It raises huge questions for people. The whole coronavirus epidemic raises the hardest question of all, which you haven't raised yet. But the hardest question of all is the, is the problem of suffering and evil. Absolutely. And we need to think about that. And how do I face that? Well, not by referring to a chapter of the Bible that uh, is coronavirus 101, but by referring to the way in which the Bible gives us deep insight into the way in which we are to regard suffering and death. And it gives us real hope because it tells us that death is not the end. And for the Christian, there is the tremendous hope of a resurrection. Now, if I did not believe that, that Christ had overcome death, I wouldn't be talking to you because I would have no hope in the coronavirus crisis, no hope in, in face of my uh, death, which normally speaking is much nearer than yours because I'm 78 as I, I speak to you. But I have great hope for the future because I believe that although the Bible doesn't address all these things directly, of course it doesn't. It doesn't talk about mathematics either, by the way. God wants us to find 
out a lot of things by ourselves, but it gives us principles at a moral and spiritual and intellectual and emotional level that can help us explore these things to a sufficient extent that we can have real hope in the midst of crisis. Uh, and that's the main thing. My question to myself is, um, have I got anything to say to people who are suffering? And I'm sure I've got way beyond what I've allowed to, but I did write a book, book on the coronavirus in the first week of lockdown. Where is God in the coronavirus world? And it's now in 35 languages around the world, which shows that people have responded. People are interested in the big questions, especially when the chips are down. Absolutely. And lastly, before I, uh turn this to the Q&A section. I was wondering if you have any one message to college students and the younger generation for how they should approach, you know, thinking about the world. Well, the important thing is what I did at university, what I was advised to do was to investigate everything and hold fast to what was good and to explore various different worldviews and to test my own worldview. And every one of you listening to me now has a worldview. And university is usually the place where it's developed. And the Veritas Forum is wonderful in giving you the possibility of investigating various viewpoints. By looking up previous Veritas Fora, you will see how there are many discussions, many inputs from various perspectives. And the whole objective is to give you a basis for making up your own mind. I am not trying to force anything down your throat. I, I'm just encouraging you to do what I did when I was a student. And I opened my mind to all the possibilities. And I spent um, the best part over 60 years testing the truth of Christianity. And that's a great thing you see. That is my last point in science. Uh, people say everything's testable. How could you be a Christian? It's not testable. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Jesus Christ promised that if we trusted him as Lord, then we would experience peace with God and forgiveness. We get a new power to live. And, you know, that I have tested in life and seen it to be true. And so it's testable. The proof of the pudding, as the old saying go, is in the eating. And you can test it as well. So in your reading, don't reject Christianity until you discover what it says. And that's true of every other thing. You can investigate, but don't reject on the basis of no knowledge. But I'm sure you wouldn't do that because you're UPenn students. And I wish you all the best in your studies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lennox, for speaking on rationality, faith, respect for others, and morality. Uh, now we'd like to open it up uh, to our audience for questions, which is moderated by my friend and colleague, Madiha Mirza. Thank you so much for everything that you said. That was absolutely a joy to listen to. Um, I wanted to dive right into the questions from the audience. We had one that's taking the lens a little bit differently and looking at um, the different sects within Christianity. So we talk about an objective truth and how Christianity seems to resolve a lot of the questions um, that we have. But when we look at Christianity itself, how is it possible to reconcile truth within um, the different denominations? And does that undermine the truth of the Christian belief entirely? Not at all. Uh, I think you'd almost expect uh, if you go into a field, uh, a field is full of different kinds of flowers. They're not all the same. And uh, in many cases, churches are like that. They consist of people of different ethnicities, different backgrounds. And so you would expect differences in their culture and all this kind of thing. Now, some of the differences we find are, are very trivial. 
the kind of music you would have or the ki kind of hymns you would sing and, and so on. Although, sadly, people can disagree about these things quite fiercely. But then there's the discussion of certain doctrines. What I find encouraging as I travel around or as I used to travel around the world, I don't anymore because of COVID, is that there's such a high degree of commonality that most people that call themselves Christian agree on the fundamental principles of Christianity. And I don't think it's as hard to sort this out uh, for students as it may seem. They're faced with all these possibilities and so on. Well, what I say to people is, in the end, you've got to decide for yourself. That's number one. Number two, as a Christian, you want to find a church that teaches what the Bible says so that you get yourself informed. And you want to meet with other people that you find you can relate to and who talk sense and are not biased or bigoted or prejudiced and so on. Now, all of us, none of us are perfect, but we can use our common sense in judging many of these things. And of course, the maturing process, which is so important. You see, God doesn't give us a list of rules and regulations that cover every minute detail of life. He does not micromanage, and I'm thankful for that. He treats us as sons and daughters and as adult sons and daughters. So we are called upon to think through and make our decisions on the basis of what we know, our experience, and so on, and make them, and he promises his help, and we can get good advice from other people. But we must always be careful that in the end, I am responsible to decide before God on what I do. And that frees me up, really, to think through exactly what I believe and, and what group I find most faithfully uh, represents the Christianity that I understand from Scripture. You need to start with Scripture uh, and read it. And that's why it's important to read it regularly. And I've been doing that all my life, of course. So there is a way through, even though it may seem daunting. But I would encourage people to deal with one problem at a time, not to try and deal with them all at once. That is that is very wise. Thank you. Um... Yeah, that's personally been something that I've been thinking about a lot. So I appreciate that perspective. Um, a second question that we have is, it seems that the default for a scientist is to be theistic. So why does an atheist accept science when it depends on the belief that the universe is intelligible to get started and on the existence of a semiotic perspective, meaning carry out, carrying artifacts to engage with? Sorry, can you give me the start of that question again? Yeah, um, so this question is talking about the theistic nature of science. So The theistic or the atheistic? The question said theistic. Um, basically questioning that if science has a belief system about the universe being intelligible. Yes, whether, okay. Oh my God, how does an atheist um, reconcile those two realities? Well, I don't think they can, frankly. I think they have to take a leap of blind faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said earlier, it seems to me that atheism becomes self-contradictory because it gives no rational justification for trusting your mind, although all atheists trust their mind. So they're they're contradicting their own basic philosophy when when they do that. Now, you need to ask them because I can't explain that. And I told you what happens when I ask them, would they trust a computer if they knew it had been generated by a mindless process? They just wouldn't. So there's a double thing. There's a logical contradiction. It is, I'm afraid, irrational. And this year's winner of the Templeton Prize is a very famous American philosopher called Alvin Plantinga. And he made the very interesting statement some years ago. He, he says there's a superficial conflict between science and God, but a deep concord. And there's a superficial concord 
between science and atheism, but a deep conflict. You see, I want to argue that God and science mix beautifully, but atheism and science do not mix. Thank you. I'm just blown away by all of these answers. This is lovely. Um, all right, moving on. How might one respond to the objection of Christianity having its roots in pagan religions? So what distinguishes Christianity from the common ritual of human sacrifice to appease the wrath of an angry deity? Well, uh, the roots of Christianity are in Judaism. And Judaism in, in the Old Testament was a protest against paganism. Uh, one of the chief characteristics of the, the ancient pagan world was polytheism, a multiplicity of gods. And uh, the world was populated by statues in all the great empires in Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, and so on. And the temple in Jerusalem was a protest against that. There was no image of God. So it didn't arise at all out of pagan religion, quite, quite the opposite. Abraham, according to the biblical record, was a pagan idolater to begin with and there are all kinds of stories and legends about him we're not sure whether they're true or not but that his father actually made idols in, in a workshop now i don't know that what i do know is that the old testament the first part of the bible says that he was an idolater and god called him out to leave his country and he came to know the real one and true creator God of heaven and earth. And his whole life and teaching is a protest against that worldview. Uh, that worldview, you see, is that essentially the gods are produced by the universe itself. Whereas the Biblical worldview is the exact opposite, that God produced the universe. The universe didn't produce God. So there's a vast difference. And those who study this, um, uh, there was a very famous professor at Oxford, Professor Werner Jaeger, uh, and he says that there's a vast difference between the pagan gods and the God of the Bible. The, the pagan gods are descended from the universe. The biblical God created the universe. And that is a vast difference. And it's a very important difference. Why? Because so many of scientists in particular in the world, when I use the word God, they're thinking of a pagan God. And they feel science has got rid of that kind of God. And that's completely right, science has. But the God of the Bible is not like the God of lightning. A little bit of science will tell you that you don't need a God for lightning. He disappears. But the God who created a world in which lightning exists, that's a very different matter. So the question is quite important. And I've dealt with it in many discussions and in many of my books. So then a follow-up to that would be, what about the... Um pagan or like extra Christian influences in the way modern Christianity is practiced today when you look at like celebrations like Christmas, which now we have Christmas trees and all, which weren't always there, or Easter with uh, Easter egg hunts and all. How do you, I mean, what are well, your thoughts? Like, I think you need to be careful. You see, I don't know what you had for breakfast this morning. Uh, you might have had cereal. Did you have cereal? <laughs> I may have skipped breakfast this morning. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, the word cereal comes from the God series. And it, it references a pagan God, but nowadays we never think about that. Yeah. Now, today is Monday. That's Moon Day. That's a, a completely pagan idea. But these associations have dropped. And what we need to be careful of that we don't think uh, that everybody who has uh, celebrates Christmas is actually celebrating a pagan festival. What often happened, of course, was that the Christians took advantage of the freedom of a feast day and they introduced their own um, uh, 
festival at the time and they may have brought various things in for various reasons but long since have those been forgotten so if people put a christmas tree in their house they're not thinking of a pagan ritual at all and we shouldn't imagine them to to be doing that thank you Okay, our next question um, is, what is your opinion on theistic evolution? And is it compatible with the biblical account of Genesis? Well, I must refer to what I said earlier. Theistic evolution is the idea that evolution occurred and God directed it. But what exactly that means is difficult to actually define. Clearly, if God directed the processes of the origin of life and the development of life, well, then I would agree with that. That is exactly what the Bible says. But when people say theistic evolution, we have to ask ourselves, what do they mean by evolution? If they mean neo-Darwinism, science itself is beginning to set that aside. And uh, that's a very interesting situation. Now, our atheist friends uh, will say they don't understand theistic evolution because what sort of a God is he who so disguises his activity that you can describe it in terms of uh, chance processes and natural selection? Now, that's a bit complicated because, of course, chance processes can give evidence of mind in the way they function. I have a self-winding watch uh, and the chance movements of my arm wind it up. It's a very intelligently designed watch. It's harder to make one of those than it is to make an ordinary watch with a wind-up spring. And what I would say to this, and again, uh, I would refer to my book because this is far too big a subject to deal with in, in just a, a couple of minutes is firstly, my faith in God does not depend on solving the evolution question. But as a scientist, I have become increasingly skeptical of the neo-Darwinian explanation. And whatever has happened, it is clear that natural processes have done some of the work. They account for some variation. That's very clear. Uh, various creatures uh, filling niches and the kind of thing Darwin saw. But when it comes to the radical new developments and body plans and new organs and all this kind of thing, where is the evidence that mindless, unguided processes do it? And since a consensus is emerging among some biologists, at least, that the basic unit is the cell and the top-down causation is just as important, if not more important, than bottom-up causation. That throws the whole question into flux. And from my perspective as a Christian, I see God intervening in the past, making certain inputs of information at a few distinct points at the origin of life and at the origin of human beings and perhaps at a few other places, but not many others. And they, in between those inputs, then natural processes were working according to what was programmed into them. It's a very complicated problem, but it's not one that the danger is. I'm not a biologist, although I love biology and I got more and more interested in it. Faith in God doesn't depend on solving a biological problem. But nevertheless, I find it fascinating when what is being discovered in biology in terms of information, for example, in the cell, uh, points towards a, a God and God said. It's an informational input. So there's a lot of evidence, to my mind, for God in, in looking at that. But Christians come to different views. That's absolutely clear. And uh, we must make up our own minds on the basis of what we understand. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you. I think that's a very, a very common view amongst students here, especially because we're learning the, the technicalities behind all of these systems. Um, and design is very rarely mentioned. Um, and so that's something we have to kind of contextualize outside of what we know. 
um well, the idea that the idea that God designed the universe, that there's an intelligent creator, is a very ancient. It's not a recent one uh, at all. Uh, the question of how God did it, we can determine to a certain extent from science. But the difficulty is that we're talking about things that are, to a large extent, non-repeatable. You cannot repeat the origin of life. So you have to make an inference historically. It's, it's what we call historical science. And that's what I've tried to deal with in my new book. I've tried to give a very up-to-date account of what we think about this whole question of a God who gives informational input and is not completely hands-off, nor completely hands-on in the question of the development of the universe. That's wonderful. What was the name of that book again? Cosmic Chemistry. Do God and Science Mix? It came out a few weeks ago and it's now available. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question that we have is that the medical field recognizes the legitimacy of NDEs, OBEs, and paradoxical or terminal lucidity. So how should a reductionist or Christian deal with these accounts? NDE is near-death experience. OBE would be out-of-body experience. So when the medical field recognizes the legitimacy of these different phenomenons, um, how would you account for that versus like the Christian perspective? I don't claim to know a great deal about it, but it does seem there, there is certain evidence pointing in that direction. What is absolutely obvious to me is, first of all, this world is not all that exists. Secondly, as a Christian, I do believe in the resurrection of the dead. I, that is, I believe in survival after death. And therefore, it doesn't really surprise me that certain people who come near to death and then come back again have remarkable experiences. I myself have been very near to death. And my experience of that, I said goodbye to my wife if you'll forgive me talking about my own experience about uh, 14 years ago, they thought uh, I was going to have a massive heart attack. I said goodbye to her because medically speaking, there was zero hope, but they managed, as you see, to uh, rescue me. But what I experienced then was a tremendous sense of peace, an inexplicable sense of peace. I knew I'd see my wife again. I knew I had total peace if I died on that operating theater. I knew where I was going. And that was my near-death experience, and it was very real. Now, you can, people can say, well, psychology explains it, but does it? Uh, it's consistent with what I believe uh, about Christianity. Uh, and so, therefore, I'm not sure that we need to take all stories uh, various claims sound very extravagant uh, and wild. But Paul, you see, himself talked in New Testament about being caught up into the seventh heaven. What did he mean by that? You see, that sounds very much like what we would call an OBE, as you called it. <laughs> you know, OBE in our country is Order of the British Empire. It's a medal <laughs> given by the Queen, so I didn't get you at the beginning. <laughs> so it, it's clear that some of these things are, are in the Bible, and I, I take them seriously. The question, I suppose, is what are you going to deduce from that? Yeah. I guess a follow-up question on that would be what about the, I'm going to stick with the acronym, the OBEs, the um, people experience that don't fall in line with Christian theology and understanding. Like, I'm personally from a Muslim background, um, and I heard a lot of people talking about like getting dreams about like Muhammad or having like apparitional visions and things. So how do we reconcile that? Yes, I know that the mind is an immensely powerful thing and we can generate all kinds of stuff in our own heads. It seems to me on the matter of dreams, the Bible is very careful to distinguish between dreams that are sent by God mm 
and dreams that are generated in our own minds, maybe even through some food that we ate uh, and so on. I've got, during this past lockdown, I, my wife and I have had the strangest dreams. <laughs> and therefore, we've got to test all of these things by reality. Are they leading to something? I, I mentioned earlier the, the theories of truth. And one of the major theories of truth in philosophy is the correspondence theory of truth. If something is true, it must correspond with reality. So if I say water is a mixture of oxygen and hydrogen, that corresponds with testable reality. So we regard it as true. And therefore these things have got to be tested. Do they correspond with reality? Because we know the human mind is capable, uh, unaided, but especially with drugs, of producing all kinds of very strange things. Very true. How would you like practically go about testing for someone who might not be as well versed with scripture and what it says, but might be um, struggling with these? That is what I call a generic question. Unless I know the person, it's impossible to answer that question, I'm afraid. Everybody must act within the knowledge they themselves have. They can't leap into somebody else's uh, so unless you have a particular person in mind and a particular issue, it's you can't answer it really. Uh, I think that is actually a beautiful response because <laughs> the person has their own unique journey, right? And that's right for them. Um, all right. So the next question we have is somewhat of an obscure question, and forgive me if I mispronounce any of these names. Um, but the question is, what are your views on Rene Girard and the mimetic theory, uh, which is, it's a theory of desire, um, an explanation of human behavior and culture, which originated with the French historian Rene Girard. Um, and it basically suggests that the mimetic desire leads to a natural rivalry and eventually scapegoating, which he called the scapegoat mechanism. Are you familiar with this theory at all? No. All right. No. <laughs> then do you have so any... what I think about it at the moment is zero. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, then I think we're just going to move on to our next question, um, which actually brings up law because our title was Christianity on Trial, um, which brings to mind the public court of opinion. Yes. Um, Scientific experiments have their trials, such as vaccine development. So what are some similarities and differences between fields of law and science? And I guess a follow-up would be, how does religion kind of contribute and support both of those fields or challenge them? I don't quite understand the question. Is it, is it, are you saying, look, you've trials for vaccines, what would correspond to that in Christianity? Is that what the question is? Some kind of. I think what our audience member was trying to get at is that trials are by definition um, searching to arrive at a conclusion about truth. Yes. And we have that within religion, which is what we've been doing regarding Christianity. Um, but I think that they were asking if you have any additional thoughts of how that correlates to science and law. Well, nothing more than I actually said, but it, it's worth uh, underlining that in, in science, we have two ways of thinking. The, the first one, which is the familiar one, is called induction, repeated experimentation or trial. So we can do an experiment again and again and again, we get the same result. And I can tell you, if you do this and that, you'll get, if you do A and B, you'll get C. And that is called an inductive proof. It gives you evidence that the thing is universally true. But then that is only valid for repeatable things. Many things are not repeatable, like the origin of life, the origin of the universe. And uh, historical events are not repeatable. You can't repeat the war Battle of Waterloo to see whether Napoleon was defeated or not. Yeah. You have to use what's called abductive inference. That is inference the best explanation. And uh, I suspect we all know that the best explanation of 
the history subsequent to the Battle of Waterloo is that Napoleon was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. And so historians work very much on inference to the best explanation, not on inductive proof. And that's at its clearest with a detective, Hercule Poirot, when he sees the murdered man lying there, he doesn't say, well, now let's just repeat the murder to see who did it. Well, th that's absurd. You can't. So he has to make an inference. He said, well, A had the opportunity to do it. And if A did it, we'd expect B to happen. But B didn't happen. However, if C did it, we'd find B did happen. So C is a better suspect than A. So th that's the way it works. And in the end, you get the grand denouement. So that kind of uh, reasoning we need to use in terms of history. Events like the resurrection, unique. Events like the birth of Jesus and his miracles, they are unique. But then we can use inductive reasoning on the experience of Christians. You see, at the end of the formal session, I said Christianity is testimony. Jesus makes certain promises for those who trust him. Uh, deliberately as a person, uh, personal step of their will and commitment. And if they trust him as Lord, then they receive at that moment forgiveness. That's a very real experience. They experience peace and a new power to live. You can test that very easily. Yeah. And, you know, it's very interesting. We're at the University of Pennsylvania. Would you like to hear the story? Absolutely. Because I did a Veritas forum quite a long time ago, I think it was at Harvard. And when I'd finished, a student uh, stood up in the in the balcony, and he said, just look at me. We were talking about this business of does Christianity work? Just look at me. And it was a very large audience, way over a 1000, maybe 2000 students. So we all looked at him. <laughs> and I called up, of course, I said, why should we look at you? Now, here's what I remember him saying. He said, six months ago, I was at UPenn and I heard Dr. Lennox give a talk. And afterwards, I started thinking and I started exploring because my life was in a complete mess. And he described what that was. I can't remember the details, but I remember his face. He was utterly transformed. And what he was saying to us all was, I came to be a Christian. I trusted Christ. He might have put it in a different way. I was born again. But whatever he was saying, he'd met Christ. And his life had been completely changed. And he said, just look at me. So the difference between him listening as a student at UPenn and coming to hear me at Harvard or wherever it was, was evident in his radiance. He had peace, he radiated, he had meaning in his life. And that's what I mean by we can test that. Now, I've seen that happen again and again in my own life, of course, and my wife's life and <laughs> my children, but in many, many students and other people. And that's one of the reasons I'm utterly convinced that Christianity is true because it works. Wow. Well, thank you. That was a a beautiful combination of the fact that science does replicate a lot and that's a strength of the field compared to law mostly dealing with post hoc deduction um, and then how Christianity approaches logic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question, um, but feel free to be brief about it. Uh, one of our audience members was asking about the horrific history of the Christian relig religion, such as the witch trials being carried out in the name of God, slavery being justified in America for generations by Christians. Um, additionally, the Crusades, Spanish, Inquis Spanish Inquisition, sexual abuse within the church. So how might a Christian respond to someone with such objections. Well, with shame. Against it. With shame. You see, I come from Northern Ireland. So I know all about sectarianism and violence. It affected my own family. My brother was nearly killed uh, by a bomb, a sectarian. Uh, 
thrown by people apparently in the name of Christianity. And I'm often asked about these kind of questions and uh, people say, what do you feel about it? And I say, I'm ashamed. But I explain precisely what I'm ashamed of. I'm ashamed that the name of Christ has ever been associated with people who take up weapons of violence, who abuse other people, who resort to awful uh, kinds of persecution and witch hunting and all this kind of thing in the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. And why am I ashamed of that? Because Christ forbade it himself. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned law a bit earlier, and I didn't quite pick up on that. I wasn't sure what you were saying, but let's think of the way the law works. Because Jesus was put on trial. And I used to wonder, why is there so much in the New Testament Gospels about his trial? And it suddenly occurred to me how important it was. Because what many people do not realize is that Christ was accused of being a terrorist. In other words, using violence to promote his kingdom and his cause. And Pilate, the Roman governor, was so afraid of people fomenting religious violence that he decided to conduct the trial himself. That was very unusual. And what is very interesting is that the issue was, was Jesus a threat in terms of violence to Pilate and the Roman government. And Pilate said to him, are you a king? And Jesus said, yes, I'm a king, but not in the sense you think of it. My kingdom is not of this world. And he explained what he meant. My kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would have been fighting. And of course, Pilate knew he would have had a report from the centurion who he had sent out to arrest Jesus, that Jesus had stopped his two disciples who had swords, only two out of the 12, who'd foolishly tried to use them. And Jesus said, put up your sword. If you use a sword, you'll die by it. And Pilate would have known that Jesus had also healed the man who had lost his ear because Peter didn't know how to use the sword. Now, that's very interesting, you see, because I, I believe that that actually happened that Peter did cut the ear off someone and Christ healed it. But it does convey a powerful message. If you use weapons to try to defend Christ's message, you cut off their ears in more ways than one. They won't listen, which is why the questioner has asked this perfectly justifiable question. It's a very important one. The ears of many of my friends, they will not listen to what I have to say about Christianity because of the history of Christendom. So I tell them what happened at the trial of Christ. Jesus said, my kingdom is not a kingdom where the servants fight. What do I conclude from that? I conclude that people that take up weapons in the name of Christ are not following him. They're disobeying him. In other words, they're not Christians in any real sense at all. This is Christendom, and it's one of the scandals of Christendom. It is not true Christianity. Now, the interesting thing is that Jesus explained something very important. He said to Pilate, to this end I was born, and to this end I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. This is where we started this evening, that I should bear witness to the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? And he walked out and declared Jesus to be innocent. You see, Pilate was bright enough to see that the one thing you cannot do, you cannot impose truth on people by violence. Mm -hmm. That's a very important thought. Jesus claimed, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I am the truth. Not merely I say true things, but I am the truth. He is the ultimate truth, but his witness to it doesn't involve violence, force, or anything like that. So that's how I respond to it. It is an absolute tragedy. It's cut the ears off thousands, if not millions of people, but you don't find it with Jesus. And I once said to Christopher Hitchens, you know, if you really understood what Jesus stood for, mm -hmm. 
then you'd be applauding him. You wouldn't be against him.